Hey guys, what's up? This is Casey. And Coach Tom. And this is Shot Science Overtime number 210. Wow, wow. And it's been a while, but 210 is still a lot. Isn't yeah. It? And uh, we uh, welcome you guys back to another live show. And as you might see, we have kind of our new set that we're working on behind us. Um, hopefully uh, it kind of catches your eye a little bit because we're going to be filming some new videos there, some new tutorial stuff. Oh, PB and Jay is here. What's up? Um, and uh, so we're just kind of wrapping up the build on that, right? Yep, yep. And so hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have some new stuff out for you guys and kind of start rolling again with the Shot Science tutorials and some other stuff that we have that we're working on. And also, we want to uh, have you guys check out our social media stuff. So we're all over the place on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all the places. Um, and we're Shot Science on all those places. So make sure you check it out there. And make sure you guys check out ShotScience.com where you can help support us by getting some Shot Science shirts yep. and any of the other stuff that we got there, like the jump box and uh, the training stuff there. Cool? Um, so we're definitely a little rusty. And <laughs> I'm trying to remember all the goofy stuff that we always say for this thing, but uh, we're going to get our way through this. So we want to let you guys know what we're doing here first. Uh, we're going to go through and we're going to have a topic that we talked about to you guys today that we you probably can see it there up on the as the, the, the header there. And while we're doing that, you guys are going to send us your uh, questions on anything basketball related, whether it's shooting, passing, dribbling, how to fix your shots, uh, defense, vertical jump training, athletic training, whatever it is. You send us those questions. Uh, tell your friends to send their questions because then we're going to start getting into that stuff as soon as we finish with our topic. And we're going to get through as many of those as we can. And hopefully uh, we'll keep getting people to show up for the live shows. That, that is always great. Um, but before we get into that, we want to ask you guys the question of the day. And we'll, we'll bring it up again because we're going to wait for people to show up. But um, the question of the day is always this question because it's one of the most important to us. And that is what? <laughs> I've remember? forgotten the question. What? <laughs> it's been that long? Um, is, is where are you guys oh, yeah, in the where world? Where are you from? Where are you located? Yeah. Uh, because we, oh, somebody says they can't hear anything. Can you hear us at all? Are you guys hearing us? Let us know in the chat if you can hear us now. And if maybe you need to turn up your, your volume too, because we're not sure if it's us or you guys. Um, but let us know where you guys live in the world, whether it's you know in uh, Japan or South Africa or where? Lithuania. Lithuania. Yeah. We don't want to forget that one. Yeah, because um, we want to know where you guys are. We are in California, um, and knowing that you guys are watching from around the world in different places is always such a cool thing for us. So please let us know. Okay? Uh, Naka says hi, and yes, I guess that means that they can hear us. All right, that's cool. Okay, so our topic for today is the number one way to fix your shot. Um, oh, you guys, can you guys hear us, or is it just not very loud? Because I can move this microphone. Maybe I just need to hold it or something. Um, is Nak, Nak is from India. Um, okay, so if you're having a problem hearing us, let us know, and we'll try to get that yeah. fixed. Like I said, we're setting up new things in here, and so we're probably going to be a little bit uh, rusty, yeah. and we don't know if all of our gear is set up the right way right now, so um, keep, uh, keep looking out for that. We also have new camera stuff, so we'll set that up too. Yeah. Um, Okay, uh, looks like PB&J is from Louisiana. T says, I was born in New York, but I moved to Florida. All right. Cool. Yeah. So uh, keep letting us know where you guys are. Um, okay, so let's get into our topic for today, and that is the number one way to fix your shot. Uh, we get this all the time where people are just struggling with their shooting, and they can't right. figure anything out, and it's like, you know, they, it's that they, they keep trying and trying, and they can't figure it out. But what is, like, the simplest way to kind of boil it down? What is the number one issue that we usually see well you know it boils down into several issues uh, for people and one of the biggest things is I always like to start with your feet um, because that gives us a better standard for how to not uh, be off balance and, and that sort of thing but just the mechanics of the shot are really really important for us to be able to be effective well let's take the top down look at it like okay. I know there's all these small things right? right like the footwork and all that what is the number one thing I know for me, if I'm just thinking about it with a uh, you know, very wide lens, it is v uh, variables in your shot. Oh, like yeah. having too many things going on, you want to streamline your shot so that it is super smooth and, and there is no sticking or stopping points. Yeah. Everything is one fluid motion. And you got to know what those motions are. You yeah. know, that's, that's a real important part of it. 
Uh, we worked with a young man yesterday, and his mechanics were just horrible uh, because he didn't know. Um, and he had had people trying to touch, uh, teach him what to do, and they were kind of stuck on uh, snap your wrist, uh, uh, square up your feet, and that whole litany of things that go along with uh, people who don't really know an awful lot about shooting. But the thing that really is important is to understand what those mechanics are, and even more important, why do we teach them that way? And, you know, we're not different than most of the people uh, who are teaching uh, uh, players uh, how to shoot the basketball, who kind of know what the program is. Uh, and, and so the mechanics of the shot are really important. Just starting at the top, like Casey was talking about, is that when we release the ball, I saw a little uh, thing on, on the internet this morning, which I thought explained pretty good, and it showed a hand on the back of the basketball, and it was showing that the index finger was pointed uh, to due north, or to, uh, we often refer to that as a clock face, and it's pointed to 12 o'clock. And, and then they also talked about having the second finger in there, that's fine too, but what happens then is that if we get the finger pointed over more toward one o'clock, the elbow's in too tight and we're not gonna be very effective. And let me go the other way now. If we take and have the elbow out too far, then the hand turns on the ball and it's probably gonna give you side spin because it's gonna finish off the last couple of fingers. So that, that's a couple of things that are real important for us to be better in our shooting. Just developing decent mechanics yeah. that you can do over and over and over and over again. So one, one of the, the mistakes or misnomer things that goes around a lot is that you have to have all these bells and whistles on your shot to make it better or higher level. Yeah. That is kind of the furthest thing from the, from the truth because yeah. if you look at the guys that are the most elite shooters in the world, they have really parred down all their mechanics to the bare bones what they need to right. be stuff. Right. It's the people that get into kind of these uh, – hitches and giddy ups that have all the problems right yeah. because they have something that they're trying to repeat that's the, you know that's the thing with any kind of mechanic if you're trying to repeat it constantly all over over and over and over again and get the same result you want it to be as simple as possible because if it's super convoluted and complicated you're not going to be able to do it it's like yeah. you know trying to play some some classical song on the guitar as opposed to you know playing smoke on the water it's yeah. like you know you want to make sure that it is like very straightforward and and very much repeatable every time you do it so that whether you're shooting a three-pointer mid-range free throw they all look the same all have the same feel they all have the same mechanics um you know some people <laughs> add these kinds of things to the shot that kind of screws them up uh one thing that we do is we have a tendency to drop the ball down in front of our belt uh and then bring it back up to shoot it we call that peeing on the ball and, and we try to use that terminology there to get them to understand that's not what you want to do. You want to have that, that ball up in the shooting position. Uh, they often call what the uh, word they use for that, the um, shot, shot pocket. pocket. Yeah. And we don't particularly pay much attention to that terminology. Well, we call it like the set point. The set point is what we really kind of go on. And so the ball is always right into the set point. Now, whether you have a low set point or a higher set point, it really doesn't make any difference. We want to make sure that we don't bob that ball up and down. Two reasons. One of the reasons is that when you take and put the ball in front of you and drop it down, there's a defender usually in front of you, and they can knock that ball loose. And secondly, which it's, it's bringing, I mean, that's bringing the ball right into the danger zone. Yeah. You know, we call it the box, yeah, but the box, yes. you know, if you bring that ball into that area, that kind of chest to waist area, yeah. that is a dangerous place. Well, it is. And the other thing that kind of comes out of that too, is the fact, and you stop and think about this, I catch the ball and I dip it down and then bring it back up again to shoot it is time that it takes to execute that. And that's time that you're giving to the defense yep. for them to get in and crowd you and contest the shot. If the shot is up here and it, you're into that set point and release uh, earlier, it's probably going to be a benefit to you as a shooter. Yeah, and uh, we're seeing lots of great questions in there, guys. Keep them coming, and please yeah. tell your friends and stuff to check us out, too. Um, to tag onto that, too, lots of people get into this thing about, um, you know, the dipping the ball and not dipping oh, the ball. Yeah. And, you know, we're not here to just blow that out of the water. No, if, no. if that's something that people want to do, fine. One of the things that we are big on is talking about the reasoning behind not doing something or doing something yeah. and kind of weighing the benefits and, and the cons on that stuff. So if that's what you want to do, we're not going to fight you on it. No, no, no. But, but here's the thing. When it comes to dipping the ball, it's not necessary in our point of view because 
people do it simply to gain rhythm to generate power too well yeah okay generate power and gain rhythm but when you're shooting your shot you should be stepping into every single shot that you take right doesn't matter if uh you know you're wide open if you're being covered if you're 10 feet away if you're three feet away you should be stepping into the shot because when you're doing that you are starting your shot before you even catch the ball so you're staying low stepping into the shot which starts your footwork that footwork is what generates your rhythm instead of having to do any kind of uh, magicianry with the ball or anything like right. that you are using your feet to generate the rhythm so that you can cut all of that stuff out yeah. and while, when you catch the ball you can catch it you know at your set point or just going into your set point and already have the shot going up before you even have to to try to generate any rhythm because yeah. you've already done it with your footwork right um, and so that's one of the things where we don't like to see players when you know, a lot of times in the NBA they they uh, you know they'll throw a pass to a guy that's down in the corner and that guy is just standing there and doesn't step into the pass right. but he catches the ball then he has to dip and do something to generate the rhythm we, we're not fans of that so even if he has to take a sidestep into the catch then he can generate rhythm and go right up into the shot right. um, which will give him more time and also it's a better way to generate rhythm too because oh, it's yeah. more consistent yeah. and everything yeah and that should be something that you do every time. Now, let me just take and go back and embellish that just a little bit. One of the things that we're really big on, too, is making sure that uh, you get your legs into the shot and make sure that when you finish the shot, that wrist has a really soft, soft finish. And, and the reason that we call it a flop finish, and notice that my wrist isn't as floppy as it used to be, but the thing is, is that when we release that, that ball with a very soft wrist off the fingers, the uh, first two fingers here, what happens is it's not spinning very fast. And, you know, a lot of coaches, I've heard this since I was a young kid myself, they tell you to snap the wrist. We don't agree with that, uh, but this is our point of view, and we, we can back it up pretty much too. Well, and, well and the, the, let me go ahead. Are you doing the reasoning why? Uh, I'll get that in just a second. Right. One of the things that's real important is that when we, we shoot the basketball, and it has a lot of rotation on it. If it's not right on the money, which oftentimes you're shot, or maybe on the edge of the rim or, or that kind of stuff, what happens is that the faster that ball is spinning in rotation, this is kind of what Casey was getting at today, and then there's going to be more of a rebound off of the, ba- uh, off the basket. If you have a very floppy finish like this, the ball spins slower and it has less captured energy in that rotation and then it's probably going to stay close to the basket staying close to the basket with a nice arc probably is going to give you a shot that it has still has a chance to go in even though it came off the rim so we think, yeah. just think that that soft wrist and is really really important yeah and sometimes you know it's us getting into the semantics of what people talk about like saying snap and flick and all that stuff but we think that that's important because when you hear those words there's a certain um, connotation that comes with it and yeah. that snap means there's tension and you're really trying to whip it and, and flick same thing flop really imparts that nice gentle uh, turnover of your wrist or your hand over your wrist and again that what, what you do to the ball will be imparted to the ball so in the flight of your ball going towards the basket you don't want it to be spinning so hard that when it hits the backboard all that energy that is bound up in the ball is released on the backboard of the rim yeah. because then that just ricochets and you know it's, that that energy has to go somewhere yeah it's a long rebound so if you have a very gentle backspin from that flop finish your ball will hit the, the the rim or the backboard and have just the right amount of energy that it expels to reverse the the travel of the ball yeah. Yeah. and keep the ball around where it is at the rim so it has a second chance yeah. but if it just blasts through uh, you know it probably sounds real nice when it goes uh-huh. through the net but you know if, unless you're making a swish every single time that's not going to happen for you and that's why you see when people shoot it and it, it either it's because it's super flat or because it has all this energy but if it hits the rim and it just doing 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 or it just hits the backboard and it goes flying off that's too much energy on the ball right well you know um for a long time i didn't understand all of that didn't think very much about it because i was buying into snap the wrist and this this goes back maybe you know, you know three or four decades when I, I was reading this article from by a professor who was from uh, Florida, and I don't remember what the uh, school was. Doesn't make any difference anyway. And he was real interested in basketball, and he was also interested in examining uh, the shot and figuring out number one, uh, what would be the proper arc 
and and you know coaches uh, you know they have their own opinions about what arc uh, should be and and we do too but the other thing that they talk about is uh, the number of rotations as it's on the way to the basket. Right. Now, what happens uh, when you're shooting the ball, uh, let's say from the free throw line, his whole pitch was this, that the ball should not make any more than uh, one and a half to two and a half rotations on the way to the basket. Well, you, that's pretty slow. Okay, and then the reason for it was the fact that there, you don't have a whole lot of energy captured in that basketball, and so, like Casey has said, it will tend to stay around the basket. Yeah. And if you couple that with a nice arc, and you know, we'll talk about arc maybe a little later, what you find is that it hits that basket and it tends to uh, be really soft. Maybe only a, we kid the kids about getting a rebound there on the ball of you know two to six inches. That means it's not bounding away from the basket really aggressively, and you often have a chance to get a finish on that without having to do anything else. So the number of rotations on the basketball from the free throw line, uh, one and a half to two and a half complete rotations, we teach that all the time. We think that's really uh, important. Okay, I'm gonna tell you guys, keep sending in your questions so that we have enough that we can go through and, and really kind of hammer through on those. Again, I will say, and we've gotten a little off topic from our, our <laughs> main thing, which is not out of the ordinary, but. Mm -hmm. Um, we we also I think we just need to go back and do our shooting videos okay. and kind of do yeah. like an ultimate kind of walkthrough on, on our shooting again. Right. Um, so hopefully you guys can can stay tuned for that stuff when we we're gonna go through and do our videos on shooting and kind of update everything yeah. um, and have uh, that info info for you guys. But I will go back to our main point, which is the number one way to fix your shot is to par everything back down to the minimum of what you need to get that shot repeatable and effective. And, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people that are saying, you know, we, we think they're gimmicky things where it's like, do this with your feet, do this with your arms, do this with your head and do this with your body, you know, all these things where that is not really where you want to go. You want to know what the fundamentals are and really make sure that you kind of dial those in and use something like uh, the three pillars of practice that we always talk about, which is you know the first pillar being uh, really dial things in with something like the form shooting drill, then step that up to game speed, game intensity, and then do your game application stuff. Right. But really working on eliminating all the hitches and all the, the sticking points and everything, because I will tell you that one of the biggest things that we see that kills the power and the distance and the range on people that are shooting, which I know is what most people want, they want that deep three. They want to shoot that three ball. Um, yeah. Is sticking points and having parts, you know, motions of your shot stop and start. Right. Um, you're not connecting the feet to the, the arms or the feet to the, or the lower body to the upper body. That is the number one way yeah. to really just kill your power. Yeah. And so it's, it's all about streamlining in terms of eliminating variables so that there is less complexity to your shot, yeah. and then also making sure that your shot connects from feet to follow through, yeah. right? Yeah, true. And you, you know, one of the things that, that we take as a, an approach when we're teaching is this, is not only are we, we are gonna teach people how to do things, but also we're gonna tell them why. Yeah. And most of the time, um, you know, people, uh, coaches generally will say, snap that wrist. They don't tell you why. Uh, they'll tell you to take and, and make sure you keep your uh, uh, your eye on the back rim. Well, they don't really tell you why. Um, and so our whole approach is this, is that we'll tell you what we think is the best way to go about it, and then we'll tell you why. Yeah. And once you kind of begin to understand the why of, of doing these different things, and you see that they result in a good product, then you can kind of fix your shot on your own. Uh, and, you know, uh, that's something, the message that I give to kids all the time. I want you to take, and when you're finished here, and you're playing basketball, or you're shooting around, I want you to be able to figure, okay, okay, I know what's happening here, right. okay? And um, so it's important to have the why we uh, teach it that way, so you understand what you need to do, okay? Okay, so I uh, want you guys to keep sending us your, your things to talk about. Also, if there's any like topics that you want to talk about, send those to us too. If there's something that you just cannot handle not having us talk about, you can do a super chat, which would be super awesome. Oh, yeah, that'd um, be great. But uh, let's kind of stop where we are on that one. Okay. And we can go back on If you guys want to talk more about that stuff, that's totally cool. So just let us know. And, uh, again, our question of the day is, where in the world are you guys from? Yeah. We want to know. Yeah. Um, I think there was a few people that were telling us. PB&J said he was from Louisiana. Naka said they were from India. 
Um, T told us they were born in New York and moved to Florida. And Zeno says, hey, lovely people, greetings from Amsterdam. Um, awesome. So if there's more people out there from different places, let us know. We want to know. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's start getting into some of these questions. And while you guys are listening, please send us more questions. We don't care how many you send. Yeah. Go for it. Right. <laughs> Go nuts. <laughs> um, okay, so let's go up to the top here. Um, Andrew Evans is asking, how do you fix your shot? Um, well, you know, we kind of been uh, working on that as we've been talking here. The w best way to fix your shot is to take, uh, if it were me, I would video myself. Yeah. And I would video myself from the front and the rear and from both sides to show you exactly the mechanics that you're executing when you shoot the ball. And, and when you look at that now, okay, I didn't realize my elbow was way out there. Uh, or you'll find that maybe what happens is that we like to have everybody is in their set point have their elbow represent the letter L and the same thing at their arm and, and chest connection there, the yep. letter L. And, and oftentimes what will happen, I can't really execute it right here, is that we pull the ball back so this elbow now becomes a V. And several things happen when we do that. Number one is that we have a tendency to use the elbow as a hinge point and what happens is that the shot is really flat. Yeah. And so what we really want is to elevate that elbow so that we get the nice finish, the nice arc. Now, you can't kind of imagine that yourself because you can't see yourself. But if you video yourself, and we use video in our lessons a lot, we'll stop and say, okay, this is what we're seeing. Oh, okay, I didn't realize that was going on. So when you analyze your shot a little bit with video, then you can start to fix it so it's going to be what you want it to be. Yeah, and you know, the, the thing about video these days is crazy because you probably, in your pocket or your parents' pocket, you have a, a camera that can shoot slow motion video. Mm -hmm. So it's not even like you have to really work that hard to, to, get to be able to see your shot yeah. and all the fine details. So if you have a camera like that or a phone that has a camera like that, you should really be doing that anyways, even yeah. if your shot is looking really nice, and yep. then you can kind of find things that you can fine tune and all that. Um, but yeah, you the number one thing on how to fix your shot is you got to know what's going on with your shot yeah. and the the ways to fix it. Well, um, and you find out by by seeing yourself shoot. You can't see yourself looking at it from inside out. You well, have especially, to take and get get a video camera or something that will well, allow you to see yourself. Especially initially. I mean, there's yeah, no way yeah. to, I mean, there. once you get a little bit more uh, kind of fine-tuned with that stuff, yeah. you can start to feel kind of things that are getting out of whack. But right. definitely, if you're trying to figure it out in the initial stages, that's, that's really hard to do. Yeah. Um, and also, be wary of what other people are telling you, even, even like people like us. Um, you need to know about your shot and you need to know the reasoning behind why you're doing everything. Yeah. Um, that is the best way that you can fix anything that's going wonky. Yeah, right, right, right. In, in fact, uh, one of the things that we, we really talk about a lot is that when you understand your stroke and what it should be, uh, and then you see yourself, oh, okay, then you can start to uh, change it so that it will be what you want it to be. And I would have somebody videoing me uh, when I'm shooting. If I, I go out for an hour workout, uh, that's what I would do. I would have somebody videoing me, and then I'd take three or four or five minutes and look at them, and then i go on and have them take those shots from different angles. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can do that with anything, whether it's yeah. your, your dribbling or defense or anything like that. Yeah. Because, you know, it's hard to see what you're doing with your own eyes. Yeah. You know, you can only see so much. You can't see it from the inside out. Very yeah. easy. <laughs> and, you know, that's why coaches, you know, when they, they're, they're running game tapes and stuff like that and running things back is because the, the, you can look at what you're doing. Yeah. And it's hard to do that in the moment. Yeah. Um, okay. So this one is from uh, Andrew Evans who says, how do you shoot more consistently? One day I shoot perfect. The next I can't get over the rim. First left to right, then far to short. I, uh, he can hear now, by the way. Okay, okay. One of the things that, that it really is unique to everybody is that once you get your stroke down, sometimes it will go away. And uh, you won't be able to hit a bull in the butt with a scoop shovel. That's kind of, nobody understands really what that means. But you're not able to be accurate. And what you need to do then is to, to tune in uh, to the mechanics and then you'll bring them back because I will tell you this we have we have during the holidays this is the Christmas holiday usually is the big one we'll have students that we've had maybe two or three years ago and they'll call hey coach have you got time that you could spend with me my shots awful 
And as soon as they come there, we can analyze the shot for them a little bit. And usually it's one or two little things they need to change. And then all of a sudden they're back in, in the, in the uh, saddle again on that. And so you have to understand what it is you need to do and also understand that you're not going to be like that every day you go to play. Yeah. You take a look at, at, at Steph Curry or some of the really, really uh, incredible shooters in the NBA. Um, I, I was watching the guy from uh, Portland play today. His name escapes me. Damian Lillard. Um, Lillard. And uh, he can shoot the ball like crazy. But I've seen him go one for 15 a couple of times, too, where he just cannot get the ball to go in the bucket. But you can bet that as soon as that game's over, he's probably out shooting again to figure it out. And and that's kind of what you do. We, we uh, kind of comically call that FIO, figure it out. And then once you kind of figure it out, then you get a handle on it. Oh, yeah, that was happening last week, and I know what's going on. Yeah, two things on that. Consistent execution yep. is comes from consistent and purposeful practice. Yep. So if you're going out there and you're working out on Monday and you're doing a you know intense thing and everything's working for you and then you play on Saturday and you haven't done anything between that time period, mm -hmm. well, good luck shaking out the cobwebs on that. Yep. But if you're working even just a small amount of time every single day, that is way more helpful than just blasting it out on one day a week. Yeah. Um, so, But, un but un this is a key point. Uh, to kind of push Casey aside for a second. The key point is this. You need to know what your shot needs to be and you know how to make it ex execute it and know when it's not like you want it to be. Well, yeah, I, gotta, I said purposeful. Yeah. Well, so. <laughs> purposeful doesn't necessarily mean an old man what you're talking about. All right, well, I mean, that, it means that you're not just going out there and doing a shoot around right. and flipping things off from, from uh, you know, half court and things like that. It's like you're going in there and you're doing – your, your three pillars. Right, right, right. Um, and too, too often, just a, a little side note, um, <laughs> sh players will go out and, and I'll ask them, did you work on your shot? Yeah. What did you do? Well, I shot around for about 30 minutes. Shot around is not, not what I'm hoping to hear because what happens is that we're not really pur using cases, uh, cases where they're purposefully working on your shot. You want to have your brain into it. You don't want, want to know what fingers come, the ball is coming off of because you can feel it. Yeah. You want to know if the assist hand over here to the side is interfering with your shot with the thumb. You want to know all that because then those are things that you can correct. Yeah, and you know, especially you know, recently with, with Kobe and stuff like that, you hear all these stories about him getting to um, the, the arena super early and working mm -hmm. on his shot and, and staying late and everything. And he, mm -hmm. he did it not as a shoot around. Like right. that was very purposeful and everything. And you hear that, you know, Ray Allen was the same way. Right. Steph Curry is the same way. Um, and I don't know if you guys saw, but I got to interview Dirk this last, uh, you know, a few months ago. And I talked to him when we weren't filming stuff. And he was saying that, you know, he had his whole routine that he goes through, that everything is regimented. It's not just show up and, you know, I don't even and know what I'm doing. Show up and, you and know, shoot him up, yeah. It's like I show up and I have this, 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 and this that I'm going to get done. And I'm going to do that before I even leave or after the game, I'm going to do this too. Yeah. And so many people these days think that they can get by with just this casual approach to it. Shoot around. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, maybe they see that, you know, I don't know where they see that, but it's like, if you want to be a next level player, you need to do next level things. And that yeah. is that, very, like, you got to know before you even get to the gym, I'm doing this stuff. And you've thought about it because you know what issues you're having or what things you want to dial in or uh, the polishing stuff that you need to do. Um, so that is that is a, that goes a long way. And those those top players, that is what they have done and they continue to do. Right. So something to think about, How especially with consistency. Shot. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. This one is from PB and J Banagas, who says, "When I shoot, my elbow goes out, and I use a tilt stagger footing." And also the Y on my shooting hand, but it always goes out. Can you help? Okay, let's okay, take well, those one by one. Though. Okay, well, number one, I will say this. If you are identifying all these issues, you already have 90% of the problem solved. Because you know, yeah. Yeah. Um, so the next part is going in and doing the form shooting and making sure that you are dialing in everything and you're not doing those things because we can't, you know, if you tell us that and we say, okay, well, you know, your elbows out, don't do that. Yeah. So, you know, th that there's no pill that you can take other than us saying that. So you need to get into that form shooting and really work on, okay, 
I know that this is my issue. I need to get that in there and really work on not letting that happen. I'm going to do it a thousand times until I get it so that I don't do it even without thinking. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a, that goes back again to that's what the next level players do. They yeah. diagnose, they, you know, they prescribe yeah. and they fixed it. Yeah. Um, so that that's really what you want to do. Um, when you're talking about a tilt stagger, not really sure what you mean by tilt stagger. We, we do t teach the stagger towards the shooting side, right. um, making sure that that's kind of more emphasized. Not sure what the tilt stagger is. Um, and then the Y on your shooting hand. So I think you're talking about like the yoke yeah. situation. Um, goes. So if you're having problem getting things consistent, again, consistent, yeah. purposeful practice. Yeah. And, and you know, knowing uh, it sounds like you're fairly knowledgeable about this, knowledgeable about those things. Then, like Casey said, when you begin to focus on them, remember this: oh, those things understand why they're not being effective for you. That I think that's probably the core on most all things that you deal with in athletics, not just basketball, but it has to do with football and and um, tennis and all kinds of things. It's just understanding what do you need to do and why you need to do it that way and you're you'll find that you start to improve a whole bunch that's key yeah i mean if you know the problem you probably know what the solution is yes um you just have to apply it yeah okay this one is from naka angu who says i shoot like Giannis with a very arched back and i have a problem in my range please help okay not really sure hard to picture exactly what that looks like but um you don't really want to have an arched back when you no, shoot. You no. kind of want it to be very much straight up and yeah. down with, you know, athletic posture, right? Right. Now, hang on a second. Going in and looking at people like Giannis and, and people might do things a little differently. Remember that not every successful shooter is going to take and shoot with the same mechanics because some people uh, have learned to do it this way and they become very effective in doing it that way. Yeah. And so... Um, if, if you're not feeling like that's how you want to be, then you want to do something about changing it, okay? Yeah, and, um, you know, comparing yourself to these, these you know, freak of nature NBA well, players, that, that becomes a problem yeah. because, you know, it's like, okay, are you, you know, a, a six foot eleven, super long person? I mean, it, it'd be hard for anybody to shoot like that. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. So, you know, we don't like to compare shooting towards, like, these these type of players like let's let's talk about your shot in just general terms how do you shoot um and when you're talking about having problems with your range that's usually a problem in generating power yes. so maybe you're missing the connection between your lower body and your upper body um there's some kind of sticking point or something like that or you're not using <laughs> enough of your lower body you need to get your legs more into it or your footwork needs to be dialed in it's hard for us to know without seeing your shot exactly where the issue is, but those are kind of like the main ones, right? Yeah, and, and let me let me run a couple things out there. One of the things that, that we teach is this, is that when you are uh, shooting a particular shot and X occurs or Y occurs, Y. Why did that occur? What do you need to know? If the shot is short and flat, uh, typically it's because you're underpowered. And what we oftentimes think about is that our arms and shoulders are, uh, that's our machine. That's the thing that gets us up there. But it is those drivers from your core muscle uh, all down through your legs. That's where most of the power comes from. And this part of your body, the arms and hands and shoulders, that is that directs the ball where you want it to go. And it does add a little power, but the, the power base is with your, your lower body. Now, one of the things that we talk about with our students and we're working with them too is this, is that when the ball feels underpowered, it's telling you something. And, and hardly anybody I've ever come across uses that kind of phraseology where they're talking about how does it feel? And we do. And, and uh, I'll ask somebody, well, how, did that feel like it was underpowered? Yes. Why? And then we'll talk to them. If they don't know, we'll talk to them about why it's not uh, uh, enough power. It usually has to do with what we refer to as the two-part shot. Our legs extend. There, there's a pause of almost, it's just so minimal, but you can't, almost can't feel it. And then the arms go. And the arms aren't going to put it up where you want it to be. They just don't have enough power. So we teach people how to use a one-part shot so that as the legs are beginning to finish, and their extension, the ball is already on its way so yeah. that we catch that leg power. That's right. 
Um, that was kind of long winded, wasn't it? Yeah, but I mean, if you <laughs> if you need more help with that, then you, you're going to have to take a video of it yeah. and either look at it yourself or try to to hit us up with that. I'm, yeah, call us and, and we'll um, help you. Let's see here. Uh, we we answered Andrew Evans' question just a couple minutes ago, but he also wanted to say that he's from Africa, but he lives in the U.S. So hmm. that's cool. Oh, cool. Um, Insanity is asking, why did you stop uploading, going live for a while, stop playing ball because of that? Well, <laughs> hope that wasn't the case. Um, I don't know. I mean, we just uh, like we had some health things. Yeah. Um, kids came. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um and just we got busy with other things and we were also trying to gear up for kind of relaunch stuff um so hopefully uh we can get that rolling for you guys and also you know we just we just need your guys' support to do that stuff yeah. too so you know when you guys are showing up for the live show you're watching the videos you're telling your friends and family about shot science um and, and following us on sh social media and you're throwing ideas at us that you yeah. want to know about i mean um, that that's cool too and you know at the end here we'll ask you guys a few questions about the backdrop stuff that you can uh, help us with um and also just supporting us too like by getting shirts and you know kind of repping us around town that that's always great too so uh yeah i mean we've been kind of uh not doing too much of the content stuff we kind of been focusing on social media stuff but we want to change that again and we're back to do more of that stuff for you guys okay um Zeno says my shooting has really improved but i don't think it was a mechanical issue i haven't made any conscious changes it was mostly confidence i have to keep that up and of course keep practicing uh you know that's an interesting thought and one that we address uh, quite often because one of the things that we can tell in in uh, helping somebody with a shooting we have a shooting machine we throw the ball and they shoot it uh and we can tell by body language uh, where they are uh, and that's when I'll stop and say you know you're being too hard on yourself and you're expecting that you're going to be perfect every time and that's not the way this goes you'll find that there's going to be times when you couldn't uh, hit a basket if you wanted to there's going to be others when you can't miss a basket and you can't allow the confidence factor to come into the to the whole uh, program and and one of the things I tell them is this when you shoot the ball you want to think to yourself that's down yeah, you got it. That's down, and and pretty soon you start to believe in yourself a little bit, and you're not. Oftentimes, our, our lack of confidence is expressed in how we release the basketball because we're a little softer. We want to be a little bit more complete. We want to be have a little better touch. But in reality, you want to take and get up there and and let's go. Or you're, wor go. you're worried about other other people's expectations or looking like a silly person yeah. or whatever. You know, anecdotally, like myself, I know that. I used to be super confident and then I started playing on the varsity as as like a freshman sophomore and I was playing with other guys that were older more critical had a lot of pressure on me because I was one of the few kids that was playing up and then a coach was coming down on me and I could barely make a two-foot shot because I was so worried about everybody else and the fact and, that you might miss it. Yeah. yeah and you know that really got into like that self-sabotage thing and, you know, you really have to learn to shut that stuff out. And especially when you're a young person, that's super hard to have confidence just for almost no reason. Yeah, right. And, you know, um, you, you have to really work on that because all the, you know, negative thinking or intrusive thoughts or whatever, that stuff can really just bring down any, even if your shooting is really good, it can really bring you down on that. Yeah. Well, oftentimes when you're you're not having the success that you want and you're getting really frustrated, and like I said, we can usually see that in body language right away. Oh, yeah, that was the other thing that I was going to talk about, too, mm -hmm. is that you were talking about Damian Lillard and, like, people shooting and having these slumps and stuff, you know, slumps. Um, but you should really not be so critical of your shot so granularly. What, right. So what I mean by that is, like, a game-to-game, -game, like, a look at it, or quarter-to-quarter, -quarter, like, oh, man, I missed... 10 shots yeah. in a row or right. i missed you know five in this quarter yeah. uh, okay bummer but then look at it over time because there's sometimes you know maybe over a month's time where you are just shooting crazy good like 80 percent or something yeah. and then you have another time period where it's kind of plateaued and then it just takes a huge dip where you're down at like 20 percent yeah. or something like that that is going to happen but it all kind of comes back to even out especially if you are working on consistently keeping your shot consistent yeah well, the other thing that comes out of that, too, is that when you're not liking uh, what's happening with your shot, that <coughs> frustration level starts to go up. And I usually kid our, our, our students, uh, you know, your frustration level is really 
really getting out of control. I'm afraid you're going to be over kicking a hole in my fence if I don't stake and get you directed here and where we got to go. And they get a chuckle out of that, of course. And then they can kind of relax because they put pressure on themselves that they've got to hit shot after shot after <coughs> shot after shot. And in reality, some days, like Casey said, you can do that. And some days, you can't do that. Right. Okay. So I'm going to take a quick time out right here. All right. And before we get to the, the rest of the questions, and we're getting towards the end here, so if you have them, send them to us. Uh, we want to ask you guys a few questions about our backdrop. This is not the whole thing. There's more stuff around. This is just what the camera on our computer is seeing. But we have a bunch of basketball-related stuff, whether it's you know memorabilia stuff or pictures or basketballs, whatever. We want to know some of the things that you guys think that we should put up there. Um, you know, We have pictures of people. Um, let me see, just look back here. We have uh, like Bill Russell and Dr. J and Pat Summit and uh, James Naismith is up there somewhere. Pete Newell. Um, Pete Newell. Uh, Wilt. And I printed out some new ones of Kobe and stuff that we're going to pick a few to put up there. Um, but we want to know like who you guys want to see up there. Um, we kind of are skewing towards the old school people, but, you know, uh, obviously we want to represent everybody and we're going to move them in and out and change stuff all the time. Yeah. But is there other stuff that you guys want to see in there too? Um, you know, we have uh, our basketball mugs and things like that, but we just want to know kind of uh, what you guys like because we want to keep that changing and keep it interesting. And uh, you guys are going to kind of help dictate that. And maybe we'll put stuff up that people send us and stuff too. Um, but just let us know. Yeah. Well, something that you can't see clearly because Casey's head is in front of it is a basketball that has been used to the point where it's worn the hide off of it at the seams. Yeah. Now, uh, and that that says a whole bunch. Um, that means that the person who was using that basketball was really spending time on it. <laughs> the person and, that was us. That yeah, well, we did. Uh, but it, there's, they spent a lot of time utilizing that basketball to get better. <laughs> KB, you know, KB says that, Adam Morrison. Yeah, one I don't of the know things, about that one. What's that? I don't know about Adam Morrison. <laughs> one of the things that, that uh, happens is, uh, we know, we talk an awful lot about, uh, about shooting and all that, but we also cover all aspects of basketball. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, let us know people that you would want to see up there and, and things like that. And yeah. like I said, we're going to have stuff mixed and moved and all that, depending on what the videos are. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay, so let's get back to our topics here. Michael W. Yukon, attorney, says, where should you look, I guess, when you're shooting? Well, uh, if that's the idea, oh, that's an interesting question. From the time I was just a young guy, um, you know, in my early, early teens, which is about the time I got introduced to basketball, because I came from this little town in Arizona where football was kind of uh, uh, king and all that, is that... Um, Lost my thought. Well, you were talking about where, like, looking. Oh, the target. At, yeah. um, when we, you know, most everybody that I heard from, you always aim for the back rim. Well, and that goes to this point. In golf, there's this old saying, never up, never in. And, and the, that, I think, was the reason that they wanted you to aim for the back rim. <clears throat> but I will tell you this, <clears throat> that if you hit the back rim, particularly with a flat shot, it's not going to go in. And so that being the case, uh, we didn't ever teach anybody either to shoot to the front rim. We want to shoot to the the hole, and and that means the middle of that basket. And you know, some time back, I don't remember exactly when somebody says, "Yeah, but you can't see that. You can't see it. It's an orange ring, and it's got a white net wrapped around it, and you can't see it." Well, that's the that's the area that we want to shoot visually, see, and shoot the ball to is the middle of that rim. Yeah. Well, I mean. It, this is like one of those hot topic things where people get all heated about it and everything. But, you know, it, it's it's also something where we say what we think you should yeah. aim for and yeah. people are like, well, no, duh. But it's 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 not as straightforward as you think, because like you said, people are always saying you need to have like these very specific visual targets and stuff like that. Whereas for us, we do. We say that nest area. You have to kind of visualize that area in between the, the rim and everything. You know, again, people say, oh, duh. But the thing is, is that when I kind of think about it, I think about like a dartboard. And you know how we have the dartboard that is in that 3D plane up against the wall. And we're throwing the darts at it. Well, think about if you took that dartboard and you laid it down flat 10 feet in the air. You have to throw that dart up and over and try to hit the bullseye. You're not trying to hit the rim of it, yeah. right? So you have to kind of visualize it a little bit more. And 
that might seem like a lot of work to do to hit that target or it might not seem like very much to do. I don't know what's going on in your mind, but for me, it's like you, that's what you want to do. You want to be aiming for where you want the ball to go. Yeah, and, and you develop that touch for that particular location too. Yeah, and again, if it works for you to aim at some other place, you know, knock yourself out. Not the uh, top of the backboard, I hope. Yeah. All well, right. but if it works, you know. If it works, yeah. That, you also probably should get your <laughs> eyes checked, but, you know. Uh, let's see. Manny Gaming says, Coach Tom, you're the GOAT. Oh, well, thank you very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Um, uh, this one is from Kay. Hi, coaches. I've been in a massive shooting slump, and I've been mess, uh, missing, messing with my mechanics trying to fix it. I think I just messed it up more. I don't have access to a gym, only team practice. Well, you know, uh, one of the things that would probably help you a bunch is to go to our YouTube channel. And we have a shooting in a playlist, I think, don't we, Casey? Yep. And there are multiple videos in there that talk about the things that we've been talking about today. And uh, watching those and seeing what it is that you're doing after looking at some of your videos of your shooting, you may say, oh, okay, there's a problem, I see it. And oh yeah, there's another one I see, and now you'll know how to fix it. Here, here. Oh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I'm, I'm fine. I was going to say, and here are some other things that are going on, too, is that, um, you know, lots of people kind of uh, bail out when things get a little tough when it comes to working on their shot. Yep. I don't have a basket. Don't yeah. have a basketball. Blah, blah, blah. All these things. But, again, it goes back to the FIO, figure it out, or MIA, yes. make or MIH, make it happen. Yeah. Um, and you have to figure out ways to make it work. So you can, you can work on your shooting without a basketball hoop. Yeah. You can work on your mechanics. You can work on your flop. You can work on all this stuff. You can't maybe work on getting the ball to the target and everything, but you can work on everything else. Then you can also find a basketball hoop. We live in a world where there are basketball hoops yeah. everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. I went to Ireland. I saw hundreds of, or not, yeah, I saw tens of basketball hoops. Nobody was using them because they don't play it in Ireland very much, <laughs> but there was tons of basketball hoops there. Um, you know, I've been to other places and seen them them there. Uh, you know, you go to the Philippines and they're building baskets out of, you know, whatever they have around because yeah. they want to play. Yeah. So I would say have the same mentality. Uh, you know, I know that if you go on Facebook and you can go to the marketplace, every once in a while you'll see somebody that has posted their basketball hoop. Or if you can find a basketball rim somewhere, uh, you can put that up, you know, anywhere. Yeah. Um, and maybe you can get a pool together with your buddies and you guys can spend 20 bucks each and somehow get a basketball hoop. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways to make it happen. The one way to not make it happen is to make an excuse about it, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, let me run this by you. This you don't is, have to have a gym either. No, no. One of the things that, that I have realized over the years, and I've been doing this for uh, a lot of decades, is that basketball practice doesn't lend itself very well to working on your shooting. Uh, and oftentimes... Team practice. The, a team practice because they, they typically there are so many things to cover in practice that shooting, which is the most important element in the game, uh, gets kind of pushed aside and you get 10 minutes here where you can go over and, and maybe you're shooting jumpers or maybe you're shooting hook shots or something like that, um, whatever the coach wants you to do. And then it's over and you really haven't gotten very much out of it. When you want to work on your, your shot, you don't work and practice on it. You take, and in fact, this is something I, I read that Curry uh, made his remark. You go and you actually spend time just working on the mechanics of the stroke. Yeah. And that's when you start to figure out, oh, okay, I'm doing this and I got to change that. And as soon as you b begin to work that out, then you're going to find that uh, the shot is going to start to improve. It, it really will. Yeah, basketball practice is not for individual skill development. No, um, a lot of people think that yeah, that's enough to make it happen, but those are the people that never go anywhere. Well, I asked this question: Have you worked on your shot this week? Well, uh, yeah. Uh, where'd you work on it? Well, um, I shot around at practice, and I, I laugh. I said, you know, that's not practice. Uh, you, you've got to get some time where you can concentrate on what it is that you need to do. Go. Yeah, I mean, I think people have these expectations that uh, you know if basketball practice is really where you get things done but that's no. what hour and a half or two hours max usually a day and it's not focused on you it, um, it's focused on all those elements of the team yeah and you know if you want to be the next go-to guy or go-to girl or whatever i mean you got to put in the time yeah yeah you do. Um, yeah um okay 
Uh, let me see where have I been. Okay, uh, Zeno says you stopped playing basketball because they stopped making videos. Insanity. Why? Yeah, you got to keep playing ball. Yeah. Um, let's see here. PB and J says when I shoot. Oh no, we already did one. I guess. Um, K says I'm in Berlin, Germany. That's cool. Wow. That's cool. And you like this format. That's cool. Right. Um, Manny in Gaming says, how do you help my friend stop airballing? He really wants my help. I think you guys can help him. Well, well again, why? We don't know why he's airballing. Um, uh, we, can, we can make several guesses. But the, the thing is that we talked a while ago about power. That's a typical airballing number is that we, t we have a two-part shot. And we end up shooting the ball mostly with our upper body, our shoulders and arms and hands. Yep. And that generates only about 25% of the total power of your body when you shoot. Yeah. And, and so typically what it is is that, and I'll just make a quick repeat of what I said a while ago, they're not connecting the leg power, the horsepower to that shot. Uh, and what we want to do, make it a one part shot. And as the legs extend, before they finish, because if they get up to full extension and you haven't started yet, it's going to be short You can just, and flat probably. So what you want to do is as the legs are coming to the end, the arm wants to start up so that there is just a continuous flow of the power from the legs to the arms. Right. And that also, should help. And also like uh, if you're bringing your arm down instead oh. of extending up, yep. um, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons. Yep. But again, we need to kind of have more info to know why. But. Um, you should be able to look at somebody's shot and, and really kind of figure out why if you know what the fundamentals are and why things happen. Um, and you find those fundamentals at Shot Science Basketball. Yeah. Um, here's our friend Den V. Star, who we always expect to be here. Um, mm -hmm. Hello from Moscow, coaches. It's been a while. Hope you're doing well. Great tips as always. Thank you. Hope you're doing well, too. Right. Um, and then he asks, I have a question for you. Who's your favorite basketball player of all time? Oh, gosh. Who's yours? Well, there have been so many uh, because I've been around so long. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I could say one well, person. Well, it's hard to say. You know, there's different eras when uh, different players just kind of take over the game. You know, uh, I remember Pete Berovich being just a, an incredibly good basketball player. Yeah, his picture's up there somewhere, too. Yeah, I remember seeing that all go. Um, and, and uh, you know, then you get to the, to the modern era where you're looking at at uh, guys who can shoot the ball like Curry um, and, and just incredible athletes like Giannis. I mean, you, you look at some of those guys and just the athletic ability is so scary of yeah. what they can do with their bodies. And the rest of us normal human beings, we couldn't even dream about it. And here they are doing it. It's, at it's seven crazy. feet tall, too. Yeah, at seven feet, yeah. And so, um, you know, there's probably, for me, uh, they don't come to my mind right away, but over those decades, there have been players who stood out that I, I really kind of enjoyed watching. How about, do you have like an earliest favorite player that you had? What's that? Like your earliest memory of like a favorite player? Um, that probably would go back to the 60s and nobody comes to my mind right away on like that Like Wilt one. and Bill Russell. Uh, and Bill Russell. Bob Cousy. Well, and Bob Cousy. Those are two good really choices, yeah. He, he was, both those guys were really good, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. What about like George Mikan? That was like when you were a little kid, right? Well, no, I'm asking. I don't know. <laughs> George Mikan uh, came on the scene uh, in the early 40s, I think. Yeah. And uh, I, I think I was still in diapers then. I don't think I could really remember who he All was. All right, then. well. But I've read and watched plenty about him, though. Yeah, I, don't, I think for me, like when I was growing up, it was Clyde Drexler was my favorite oh, yeah. player. Yeah. And I still think he's really great. Um, I – but, you know, one of the things, like, looking back now, and I, I did not like him when he was playing, but Michael Jordan. Yeah. Um, Michael Jordan, I mean, I think when I was a kid, I didn't have perspective on it. And and also, like, he was kind of the rival of my favorite player. And looking back at him now, he was just – there's nobody even now that no. is close. No. no, no, no. And, you know, he, he, like, willed wins just by himself and most clutch dude ever. Yeah. And, you know, all the athletic ability and the skills and all that stuff and, you know, took two years off and then still came back. Yeah. And then and played baseball, it. too. Yeah. Well, um, what, for whatever yeah, reason that happened. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, a, a player that comes to my mind um, and this was probably probably early 40s. Uh, I never knew him, but his name was Hank Rossetti. 
Yeah. Um, and he is kind of credited with developing uh, the jump shot in basketball. But there was actually, and his name has escaped me at this moment, was a player at the University of Wyoming that was five foot ten, who really revolutionized revolutionized shooting uh, on the college level. Of course, then it goes right on through the the ranks of the pros. Uh, and pros weren't that big at that time. Um, I wish I could remember his name, but he was only five ten, and and he developed that jump shot uh, because he had a brother who was six foot five, and he could never get the shot off on him. Uh, and so he learned how to shoot uh, the jump shot and became very noted for it. In fact, his team, I think, won the national championship uh, when he was uh, uh, at the end of his uh, college career. Yeah. And, you know, I think that there's always – there's, like, those transformative players too. And I think yeah. that's more interesting than, like, favorite players yeah. because there's people like that. And then there's people like, um, you know, Drazen Petrovic who mm -hmm. opened up the yeah. international play. And then, yeah. you know, Dirk Nowitzki comes in, and he's, like, this seven-footer that shoots threes, and nobody had really seen that before. Well, not like he shot him yeah. anyway. And, or made him, you know. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, there's players like Giannis who's, like, this new freak of nature that, you know, he he's – 610 or 611 super long and he's playing like he's you know the 65 guy you yeah, know yeah, yeah, and he just yeah. destroys people and then there's curry who like knocks everything off of of your expectations when he's you know 62 or whatever and he's yeah. he's you know beating all these guys because he's just a sharpshooter and he's yeah. worked so hard on his handles and yeah. and stuff like that and and uh you know then there, of course there's like kobe who just you know he he was a different uh he kind of changed the way that people played too and and Shaq and you know all these guys yeah there's just Kareem no, I mean there's no there's no end of it but there's like these transformative players like all yeah. of those guys you know yep, yep very true and Tim Duncan you know um yeah so that's a hard question I mean, who are you guys' favorite players or that, players that you thought was question, transformative yeah. I mean that's that is a good question and it makes you think but it's hard to have just one I think yeah yeah usually um yeah I mean uh, that's hard. I can't think of one that is just it. Um, okay, we're getting close to the end here, you guys. But let's see. Um, Nasser is saying, "Hey, nice, nice video. What's up? Um, how do you get lots of rebounds?" Um, <laughs> well, um, you know that's that's a really interesting question. Um, one of the things that is not really really very taught well on the uh, the lower levels. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about the college level, but the lower levels is people just tell you, you got to block out. You got to box that guy out, box him out, screaming at you, box that guy out, box him out. And and I ask questions uh, of most players whom we're working on, has anybody ever told you how to block out? No. Well, what do they do? They just yell at me. Okay, well, yelling at you doesn't mean that you're going to have some immediate uh, uh uh, realization in your mind how to do it and, and and it's a it's sometimes it can be kind of complicated and it can make you a, a, a much more solid player yeah when you do I, that. I think that there is a lot of things that go into being oh, a good rebounder yeah. so many people kind of think it's just boxing out or whatever but mm -hmm. it's not uh, you know there's there, there's a whole thing about reading rebounds oh, and we've, we've done a video yeah. on that yeah um, and you, you kind of have to learn to anticipate where the ball is going to go and kind of think about the you know percentages of which way it's going to go yeah. um, the other one is being more aggressive want it more uh, and go after it and you yeah. know you you watch somebody like Dennis Rodman there's another you know transformative yeah. player yeah. Um, who basically rebounded his way into the Hall of Fame you know yep he did um, and you you look at somebody like that nobody wanted the ball more than he did when yeah. when the when it was up for grabs really you know yep. and you have to have that mentality when you're a rebounder and even if you're if you don't have the the mechanics of all that's the boxing out and everything down at least have that mentality that you're going to go after it and nobody's going to want it more than you do well you know one of the questions that, or things that casey's talking about is going after it and some people don't understand this is that just because the ball is going to go to the other side of the basket doesn't mean you just let up. Yeah. One of the things about um, – uh, what was the guy's name we were just talking about? Uh, Rodman. 
uh, Rodman, he would attack the basket 10 feet away or attack the ball. And he was attacking it with both hands. And, you know, I see this so much uh, on high school level. There's a rebound and somebody goes up with one hand, somebody else touches it and it's gone. And we always talk, uh, talk to our players about the fact that you always rebound with both hands. And when you hit the floor, that ball's right up under your chin so you can take care of it. This thought just jumped into my mind as I was saying that. One of the things that I see, particularly with younger players on rebounds, uh, bigs usually, they'll go get the rebound, and then it's like a hot potato. They just want to get rid of it. And what happens there is they oftentimes they deliver it to the other team. And what, what I think is really important is they get it up in a position where you can take care of it, and then you take and, and look for your people that you get the ball to before you do anything with it. Because if you try to panic and get rid of it too quick, you're probably going to turn the ball over. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you should you should really just be ripping the ball out of the air. Right. Um, you have to do a few other things with it, like you said. Um, busting out is one thing that we oh, that yeah. we always talk yeah. about is that you you know you get the rebound, you don't just stand there, you yeah. bust out. I mean, this is for like a, in, in transition and stuff, yeah. mm -hmm. and then you can look ahead at who is who's up there and and, and uh, ahead of you. Um, but yeah, I, I think that you have to have the tenacity to do it. And you know, you look at somebody like Rodman, and he's going up against like Carl Malone mm -hmm. and Shaq and. He's, he's you know, not as big as those guys by any stretch, but he just wanted it more. Uh, and he was kind of nasty, too. Yeah, you can be nasty about it, too. It's not a, it's not something where you can be, you know, too polite about you, taking no, the ball from people. He wasn't polite, you know? no. Um, and, you know, say what you will about somebody like that mm -hmm. with all the other stuff going on, but, I mean, yeah, he, he literally is probably the greatest rebounder ever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so when it comes to blocking out and boxing out, whichever terminology you like to use, uh, there is some footwork that really make that necessary. Yes. Part of it is is really just getting the positioning between you and and the de defender and the basketball and getting a body on them and knocking them off balance a little yeah. bit. You know, um, one of the biggest problems uh, for uh, young rebounders I see more than older ones is the fact that as soon as the ball's up, you turn and look for the basketball. Yeah. And that allows the other person to maneuver right around you. One of the things that we teach is this. If a shot's being taken from 10 to 15 feet, the ball is not going to be there for about three seconds anyway. Yeah. And so during that time, that gives you time to line your guy up and get him, get a body on him. And you know, and, and here's the other thing that we teach too, is that uh, if the ball is taken from one side or the other, 70% of the rebounds are going to go to the opposite side of the floor. And so if you happen to be in that situation, you have a little bit more time there even after the ball hits the rim to get to it. Yep. Um, there, there's so much to talk about with rebounding. Yeah. It's, it's more complex than, than you would think. It really is. Um, so we do have a few things on rebounding on our channel. So if you want to check those things out, do that. Um, but we will definitely be covering rebounding stuff yeah. very soon. So good question. One of it, the number one thing is, is like get the rebounding mentality. Go get it. Yeah. Yes. Go get um, it. Let's see. Um, here is with God. He says, do you actually put your hand in the rim or do you just look at the target? In the rim? Well, you're, I think Are he's you talking visualizing, about, you mean? I think he's thinking about how you finish it. What we want to do is on the finish is even though our arm is up here and straight, we want our wrist to be hanging over the front rim. That's a, it doesn't actually happen like that, but that is that is the goal. You, just like you're dipping your fingers in the hoop. Right. Okay. Um, Zeno says, my favorite player is Vince Carter. That's another pretty transformative yes. person. Uh, to me, he was the most exciting to watch. He doesn't play as much now, and athletically, he did things you wouldn't expect. Can't believe he's 43 now. Yeah, yeah I mean, Vince Carter, 2000 Vince Carter was literally insane. Oh, it just His ability to jump was scary. Yeah, and you know the thing about him is that he has figured out how to grow and expand his game so that he's not just the guy that is you know doing yeah. these you know space jam dunks on people. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I think he's the first player to play across four decades ever. So oh. he played in the 90s, the, the 2000s, the 2010s, and now the 2020s. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's even more than, like, uh, Kareem, you yeah. know. Um, so that's that's super cool. Um, and, yeah, I mean, he, he like, sh brought in a new level of, like, altitude <laughs> yeah. to basketball. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. He has uh, a duck when he gets to the basket. Oh, yeah. Um, and then – S Vada or Veda three two four says Patrick Beverly is my favorite. Been watching B ball since the early two thousands. Patrick Beverly is probably 
<laughs> he's not my favorite. He's player. not my favorite either. He he's a mind games kind of guy. Yeah. I mean, he definitely is a good player and plays really hard. But no question about but, being um, a good player. You know, don't not not a big fan of all the mind game stuff. But <laughs> some some people do that. Um, Paul Andrew Castro says, "I've always been a catch and shoot player, and I know what I'm missing is driving to the hoop or just creating separation by dribbling. How do you gain that confidence in game? Again." Com- confidence is built in practice well yeah and and you know one of the things that that we really encourage young players to do after they've kind of gotten some of these mechanics ingrained is that we encourage them to bring another player with them uh, and that way uh, you know uh, they can actually get into that one-on-one kind of stuff and learn how to get to the basket and how to create space when you get there yeah uh, most players are fading away and trying to get away from being blocked whereas we like to teach them to get that shoulder into that person who's trying to guard you so you create a little space and you get a good finish on that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, one of the things that to, to build confidence in, in you yourself is you have to have confidence in your skills right. and you have to work to develop your skills. Yeah, so, you know, I can understand that if somebody doesn't trust their dribbling abilities that they're going to lack confidence in yeah. their execution of them when they get in game. And you're going to turn the ball over out too. Yeah, yeah. so... I think that, again, it comes back to the three pillars of practice. You have to work on that aspect of training so that you can get the skills, then get that applied to a game and gain the confidence in using that in a game, and then go to a game and do it. So really working on skill development by yourself and then applying it up the ladder is important. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's going to do it for us today, you guys. Uh, Really glad to see everybody back. Um, we're gonna do more of these, and also, like we said, we are we have our set that we've we're almost done with back here behind us. Uh, we're we're working on kind of dialing things in, but we're gonna be recording new videos very soon, probably tackling tackling a lot of shooting stuff first because we want to really kind of uh, reissue some of our old videos that uh, have kind of maybe grown out of date. Yeah, yeah truly. <laughs> uh, in the long time that we've been doing this stuff. Um, but please let us know the stuff that you guys want us to, to do, like what topics you want to see. Um, we also have some other stuff that are maybe more lifestyle based things too, and reviewing gear things and basketballs mm-hmm. and, and stuff like that. Um, and again, we're open to your guys' suggestions and definitely let us know like some of the stuff that you want to see on our, our wall back here and people you want to see up there. Um, and also you guys can go support us at shotscience.com. You can get some shirts or the vertical jump training box that we have there. Um, join uh, Team Shot Science. Um, and like I, we say this all the time, like if you guys get shirts or anything and you're out there and take a picture wherever you are, like we're probably gonna reshare that yeah. on like our Facebook page where we have two and a half million people or whatever, because that makes us like super proud that you're out there doing that. Um, and spreading the word is just a big deal for us. Um, and um, make sure that you guys follow us on all those social media places because that's where we update on different things and we're doing different things in those places and we just appreciate the support on that. Um, if we didn't get to your question today, it's not because we don't like you guys, it's because we just <laughs> ran out of time, um, but we will be back, all right? All right. Anything Thanks, else? Guys. All, right. all right. Thanks, you guys. See you later. Got to end the stream.